All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started with the next portion of our seminar. Um, now we're gonna hear from all of our consultants um, in a panel discussion. And what we've asked them to do is, they're each gonna take five minutes to answer the question, why should a small US business consider exporting to your market? And then following um, each of them answering that question, then we'll get into some uh, more direct questions for each, uh, each country or region. Um, so why don't we start with Canada? Yeah. <laughs> I'm very prepared. <laughs> um, so I guess for Canada, we are um, your one of your closest neighbors, um, just north of the border. We share very similar cultures. Uh, there's a good um, understanding of the products that are already available in market. We speak the same language. Um, we have a very sophisticated logistics system where um, uh, the trucking system is moves efficiently 365 days um, a year um, between the two countries. Um, so yeah, those would be, I guess, the primary reasons why you would want to consider um, Canada. <laughs> Great. All right, Roger, you want to? Yeah, hello, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, I introduce myself again. You know, the, I'm the Roger Zen, and uh, with SMH, we are the SAST rep in China and uh, Hong Kong. So, and uh, we cover the two markets. Uh, one is for the mainland China, and uh, and uh, another one is for the Hong Kong. I think you know the Hong Kong and uh, China is the pretty pretty different the market. And uh, we still can see, you know, as you know, for the Hong Kong, we consider is the and uh, mainland China, Hong Kong is the we call the one country, two systems. Uh, at least right now, namely, <laughs> and uh, you know, the, for export to China and uh, or to the mainland, uh, main, uh, to Hong Kong, um, we don't have the, any the documents, the requirement, and also is there for zero, zero the tariff. So it's very easy to export to China or uh, to Hong Kong, and also for the Hong Kong buyers, and uh, they easy to, they can speak the very good the English. So I don't think you get the you know you can you will get the the barrier for the language. So I think the Hong Kong market is is get too easy to access. Also for the Hong Kong market, and uh, they can you know the re-export to the mainland China. So I think about you know Hong Kong can be considered is the gateway to the southern China. And uh, for mainland China, and uh, I want to say, and uh, with the huge the population, maybe I can give you the two the numbers related to the, the population. We got the at least eleven cities with the population is the ten million people, and we got eleven cities and uh, over hundred cities. The population reached the one million. So I think about you know the, for the pop and also I'm based in Shanghai. Uh, we consider Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. Guangzhou and Shenzhen is in south. China is the eastern side, and Beijing is north. And uh, we consider is the first tier cities. So I think you know the, if you are really want to act in the business in China, I suggest you can start it from the this the first tier cities which will be more easier uh, for these importers help you to distribute your products to more the different the, or second tier cities in China. And also in the last 10 years, the online the sales is the getting popular. So maybe, and also the logistic, the, you know, the, the, is the, the chance is developed a lot. So I think, and even for the second tier cities and the third tier cities, it's easy to find the products, imported products online. So I think that we, for China, we got the pretty good, the, you know, the opportunities for the SASTA companies in China. Maybe you will consider what's going on for the COVID situation, because later I, we can discuss more what's going on here about the COVID situation. Thank you. I won't use the microphone because I, I don't like them. I hope that everyone in the back can hear me. Uh, I'm Andrea again. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion. I come from Mexico. Emalinks is a go-to-market um, company that develops 
different strategies for uh, companies as yours to help you get into the market in Mexico. I will, as, add, as Heidi was saying, we're pretty close. Sosta companies and Sosta states are very logistical in a good way because uh, Nuevo Laredo is one of our main entry points, with, which is near to Texas. So we encourage Sosta companies to come uh, and explore our market. Buyers speak English. Uh, there's a little business opportunity on the added value products like snacks, pastas, frozen uh, um, products, even healthy that, as Roger was saying, we will uh, add a little bit more in one of the questions that we have for you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that you guys being here in the Sosta area, it's very um, important for you and for us to get your products into Mexico. And we're, we're really excited uh, to see new trends, to get to know your companies and to give you feedback with consultations. We have trade missions going, we have uh, trade shows, so you can get to know the market better uh, directly from you. Mm -hmm. Great. Fred? Ladies, first. <laughs> Microphone. Okay. So, uh, well, we are Anouk and Roseanne from uh, Europe. Well, Europe consists out of 27 different countries. Uh, sorry, the EU, European <laughs> Union. Excuse me, that's absolutely correct. Um, we cover Europe as a whole. So, also the UK. It's not part of the European un Union anymore uh, due to the Brexit. We cover the Nordics and the Baltic states as well. Um, well, Europe is one custom zone, so once your product enters Europe, it can travel freely all over the different countries, which is a huge benefit for you. Um, uh, but keep in mind that all countries are different. We have different languages, different consumer habits, uh, sometimes even different rules, currency. Um, yeah, am I missing something? No. no. <laughs> um, we have... Um, 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 we always say um, we in the north of Europe, uh, we eat to live and in the south of Europe, we live to eat. And that's already a difference you see within the European Union that all countries are different. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it's a mature market, a large market of 500 million consumers, rich market. And we have a very strong trading relationship with, uh, with the US. We have good trade connections. Um, and your US products have, in general, a good reputation in, uh, in Europe. Um, yeah, you are, like Mexico, uh, you are on the right side in, your, in the US for Europe, uh, compared to the, to the Western part, for example. Uh, you are close by. Uh, we have just an ocean uh, in between. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, sometimes it's even... Uh, easier to get your products overseas than, for example, at the other side of the U.S. I think that's it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm indifferent to a microphone, so I'll use it. <laughs> 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 so, so India, uh, I'll talk about India. India is a large developing economy. Uh, you know, we're seeing good growth that's taking place in the country. We are one of the largest consumer bases in the world. In fact, we are going to overtake the China, China population in April this year. So, <laughs> Roger, sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> So, I think overall, it's a growing economy. We are seeing, you know, larger disposable incomes. We're seeing a trend where people are truly wanting to become global and have those global experiences. So, we see good demand for products. And post-COVID, I'm going to talk about it a little later in the panel discussion. But post-COVID, I think priorities for Indians have changed. Of course... Uh, like any other market, it's a price sensitive market, but now people are willing to spend more money on uh, quality products. So we do see a good market for, you know, some of the products that we're going to mention later. But I think uh, it's one market that that's it's not an easy market. So please, uh, you know, be prepared. We are there to help you anything that you need or any anything related to the policies or the market entry points or where you should place your products to begin with because it's a large continent, a large country with 28 uh, states. So we can help you and handhold uh, the product and ensure that it's available across all platforms. We're seeing a good rise in uh, organized retail as well as e-commerce. So that gives a good opportunity to be present at different locations by while partnering with you know 
a one particular retailer or a couple of retailers so i think it's a good market and uh, we are there to assist you and uh, help you with uh, entering the market thank you all right okay i'm going to stand up so <laughs> you guys can breathe <laughs> and uh, my name is fred belin escarraman my father is to blame <laughs> but i'm going to make it easier for you you can call me fred not to be confused with fraud, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm legit. <laughs> Thank you for having us here today and to Susta also for flying us all over to come here and share what the little we know with you guys. So, so why exporting? Very simple. We all want to make money, right? So profitability is the best, the, 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 the mo one of the most important things that you will get out of exporting. It's not easy. If you, at the end, decide to get into the madness of exporting, you'll come on the other side uh, a completely different company. So profitability is going to be one thing that will be impacted in your company. You'll be making more money, growing, creating more jobs, and what comes after that. The other thing is, not relying on a single market. Nowadays, it's very important for you, your company, not to rely on a single market because things can fluctuate. Right now, the economy in the United States is recuperating jobs. I, I read this morning that 260,000 jobs were created uh, last month. Uh, unemployment is 3.7% here. So, the outlook is looking good, but what happens if things changes? You have other markets that will probably not be impacted by a recession at that time where you'll be making money too. So that will help you, you know, balance it out. And also knowledge, which is extremely important nowadays. You know, learning how to do this will definitely give you an edge on competitiveness. Alltech is an example, you know, they're all over the world. So can you imagine the experience of learning how to do business all over the world? It's extremely complicated. In each of our markets here, you're going to have different issues and barriers and things and culturally differences, you know. So coming out of that other end, you'll definitely be a more competitive, profitable and diversified company. So that's why it's important to consider exports. The money is there. You know, you can log in into USDA websites and they have all the information. The, Carib uh, the Central America region, which is the one that I cover, a couple of billion dollars worth of exports from the U.S. to that region. So, you know, any percentage out of a couple of billion dollars, you know, it's something to really motivate you to start looking for information. Now, is it something that's gonna be done overnight? No, it takes time, takes uh, patience. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I've known companies that have negotiated with a partner overseas for a year and a half, 18 months, but at the end of the day, they are consistent and it happens. So that's why it's important for you guys to consider exports and you also have a competitive advantage that is provided through SOSTA and other U.S. government programs. You go into Google and you look for exporter guide USDA you're going to have reports from all over the world telling you you know the basics on what to look for in a market for exporting. Mm, uh, if there are other governments doing that in the world, there might be maybe two or three more. So there's a lot of resources for free available for you. So take advantage of that. And, you know, you have all, all these expertise at your service. I started doing this uh, the other day, 2007. <laughs> I got involved with U.S. agriculture in 2003. I used to work for FAS, for USDA. So... I'm not saying I'm, I'm the most uh, knowledgeable, but you know this is 
you know, worth it. It, it doesn't have a price. So take advantage of that. So I'm very happy to be here. And anything that you need, any questions, uh, I'll definitely be more than willing to talk to you during the one-on-ones. Thank you. All right. Thank you, all of you. And thank you, Fred, for that. Um, so what we did was we took some of the main themes that we've seen over the last couple of years um, that that we're all talking about all the time, things like COVID and health concerns, um, shipping and logistics. And we, uh, we selected questions for each particular market. So I'm going to direct one question to each um, each market, and they'll take the lead on that question. And then once they're done answering, then any of the others can chime in on it. Um, so that's how we'll start our panel discussion. And I'm going to start with China. Roger. Yes. So the question is, how how has the food and agricultural landscape changed post-COVID? And what lasting effect did the pandemic have? Okay. And uh, first, I want to give you an update what's going on in China for the COVID situation. Because you know, the, I think China is the, in the world is the only one still for some part of the city being locked down and uh, not uh, fully opened. And uh, maybe I can, we can speak to the two different markets, as I mentioned to you, Hong Kong and China, mainland China. Hong Kong is pretty different. Right now, our travel, travel the policy, we call it the zero plus three. What's mean the zero plus three? For zero is that you know, you don't have need you know, any of the, the, the test the report, and they're easy for you to travel to Hong Kong, and also no mandatory for the quarantine, and in the hotel or at home, and uh, that is called the zero. It's easy, you can go in out. And what means plus three? Three is means you know, the, in the, from the you are in the, arrival in the city, in the next three days, you can go most of the place, except it's not allowing you go to the restaurant. So it means you know, the, you take the meal only in the hotel for delivery, or you just uh, buy the food, Eat in the restaurant, or cannot eat eat in the restaurant, only in the you know, the place which you stay, or you at home in Hong Kong, or you stay eating in the hotel. So they, you only can take the box, lunch box, meal box. Yeah. So they, I think that still it's a little bit challenging, but uh, if you have some the business the meeting, still it allowed you to go to the office, go to the supermarket, buy the shopping, go to the restaurant. Only you can order then to take take to home or take to the hotels. That is the, for the Hong Kong. So that is the policy for the Hong Kong. And uh, for mainland China, and uh, it's more challenging. Still, we got the mandatory for quarantine. We call it the five plus three. What's mean the five? Five is the mandatory. You stay in the hotel for quarantine. And this is the you, you need to stay in the hotel. You book the hotel. And the hotel, the, co the cost is needed to pay by yourself. The government is not, you know, to pay for you. And the five plus three, another three is for the, our local residents. And the three days, you need to stay at home. It's not to be allowed because we got the barcode for the, for the, for the cities. You can scan, you need to scan the barcode. They give you the barcode, the color is changed to the red. So it's a red color. It's a, when we scan and the, 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 the entries for the all the shopping mall and any place, you'll be blocked. So it's not allowed. So it means you know the, for eight days for the for your visit to China, mainland China, it means you eight days. It's not allowed. Also, when you're boarding, you need to show the PCR test report. <laughs> um, seems in a very complicated, but um, since the last week, something is seen the good signals, and uh, it's pretty bad. You know, the, a few weeks ago, it happened because there's some city of the lockdown, especially in the Xinjiang, we got the, the fire, make the ten people die. 
that, yeah, that seems very bad, even including the one kid, just the three years old. That's in the very bad stories. And uh, also, mm -hmm. the, in the different cities, like Shanghai, Beijing, appear during you know, the demonstration to, against this policy. So, seems the, the government just woke up from last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, they canceled some of the, the quarantine the policy. And uh, they just, because you know, the, for the local residents, if you go to the office every 40 hours, you need to do the PCR test. And if you don't do that, your code, barcode, and interest barcode will be changed to different color. Mm -hmm. So that's what be, you will be blocked to, not to every, and, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, it's good things as you know, that the government gradually to change the policy because the China is such big the territory. So I think uh, uh, for the next three months, and uh, the government will be gradually to change the policy. I can see maybe the, the second half year, China the, for the travel policy can be totally can be open. This is the, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, and, uh, according to current the, the trends and the government, the current change the policy. So I think about it for the, it means, you know, for the first half year, still is challenging for the international visit to visit the Chinas. Um, that is the trouble, the policy I want to let you know. And uh, for Hong Kong, still is okay for you to travel, to meeting, to join the meeting, to for the traditional attending, you know, still is possible. For the mainland China, let's, you know, the skip the, the first half year, Let's see what's going on for the second half year. Um, that is the for your travel and uh, for your schedule. And I think it's very important for you. A uh, little bit complicated if you don't, if you have questions and uh, just give to me and I will give you my email address. I can send more information to you. This is pretty complicated travel policy. Mm -hmm. Market. And the uh, market is changed. And uh, in the beginning, uh, due to the COVID situation, the logistic, the, the for the logistic, almost the shutdown, and also the, for the customer clearance, always be delayed. And after three years later, and it's uh, the situation is much better. So I think that for the container delay, such kind of the things is almost you know is the, is it be avoided. So don't to worry about that. And uh, market opportunities, I think the online shopping is continually being you know, the popular. So the, I, I think about you know the, during the COVID, most rely on the delivery. So the China is pretty you know the early to um, use the online shopping for for the you know the online shopping. So I think about you know the uh, online shopping is still is the popular in China. Uh, the second is the for the because the SaaS the region we get the more source and ingredients. I think you know the after COVID the family the, you know, cooking at home is, is is pretty common compared to before. Mm -hmm. So I think about you know the, the source and the ingredients for the retail stores is getting popular. So I think this is another opportunity for the SaaS companies. And also the, the health the products and the nutrition products is another opportunities um, for the China market as well. And uh, as same as they didn't know any changes like you know the tree nuts and the beverages, juice, meat, seafood, you know, the always you know the, it's a demand, high demand for the Chinese market. This is not a big changes. So market is changed and uh, it's gradually and uh, I think about it is more chances for the ingredients and the source. It, it's definitely the sales is increased mm. a lot. So I think about if uh, I don't know that any companies here is the carry the ingredients and carry the source. That is the big opportunities in, in China. Mm. So I think you know uh, Hong Kong and the Chinese different market. Uh, China still, the, you know, the, I, I think about the price point products is getting <laughs> you to access this market. For Hong Kong's the market, the, the, the people's the income is much, much higher um, than mainland. Hong Kong is, the, I think, it's still ranking the number one, the most expensive cities in the world. 
So I think the Hong Kong people is more accessible for the high end. So I think about the Hong Kong can be the high end, and the mainland is more price point. So I think about it the, for China, Hong Kong market, both can be a small, wider range for the price. That's about the China market. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I remember I was in China in 2012, and there everything we were talking about was in-home delivery of groceries, and we really weren't doing that here yet. And it was like kind of mind blowing at that time to think even fresh groceries were getting delivered, and they were still fresh on your doorstep. And you know, it was this whole new um, thought for me as an American. So I mean, China I think was really ahead of the curve when COVID hit, and uh, yeah, the home delivery. Um, and now, as, as Roger said, I mean, people are really cooking more at home and there are a lot of opportunities for those kinds of ingredients. Um, so does anybody else want to chime in on that or add anything? Um, I'd say for Canada, we're very similar to the U.S. Um, so, you know, some of the, the changes or the lasting effects that we have are probably ones that you are experiencing here. And I think one of them is... Um, a stronger support for local products. Um, our uh, industries have suffered the last couple of years, so there's stronger support for local products in Canada as much as there are, I, I'm sure, here as well, as, as much as you're trying to support your local uh, companies as well. So that's just maybe from your perspective, increased competition that you need to um, consider. And then um, inflation, I think uh, <laughs> everybody knows that we're all experiencing it. Um, the rising cost of labor, um, uh, the, the shipping logistical issues have contributed to increased prices. So consumers are uh, definitely more sensitive and thinking about the value of the products that they are buying. Um, when it comes to e-commerce, I think there has been a bit of a growth in the Canadian market over COVID, but I, I heard recently that Amazon sales in uh, Canada are dropping, so we're not sure if um, the e-commerce trend is uh, here to stay, especially in the uh, packaged food and, and beverage space. So, yeah. Anyone else? So in India, I think uh, you know the major change that we saw was companies going online. E-commerce earlier was limited to fashion and electronics. But uh, since COVID hit, we saw a lot of companies like Amazon and others have same day deliveries and you know other things that have really, uh, the market's really grown. Uh, it grew by about 50% in the first year of COVID and then about 80%. So uh, it's, it's uh, provided opportunity to a lot of uh, brands to be present across the country. Uh, while saying that, it still occupies only a 4% share of our total uh, retail uh, you know, uh, ecosystem. So it's definitely increasing rapidly, but uh, still has a long way to go. Yeah, I, d I think for Europe, we can uh, say a lot of things that have already been said. Um, I'm happy that in Europe, we don't have the situation anymore that's in China still, um, but yeah, we see a lot of home delivery groceries and that's something that stayed. Um, yeah, uh, uh, people are more conscious about their health. Uh, uh, healthy snacks are, for example, uh, 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 a great product that we are looking for, but also um, non-alcoholic beverages, for example. Uh, so we're looking for alternatives for the products that we already had and COVID boosted it, this even more. So that's something that stayed after COVID. Yeah, well, for the home delivery, something for us unique we, we saw in the past few years is that, well, a lot of supermarkets are nowadays um, bringing their groceries at home. Uh, and that's here to stay. So that's, uh, that's, that's nice. But we also see um, deliveries that's in the that, that's uh, delivered in within 10 minutes especially in the big cities uh, so a very uh, fast delivery and that's also a, a growing trend um, so people would like to have the groceries now <laughs> yeah all right anybody else all right and one thing if everybody would use the mic because they are recording it brian just told me yeah, yeah. Oh. So, thank you.
Little disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you all. Um, I know COVID is still top of mind when we're thinking about um, exporting into all of these different markets. So, of course, that's top question. Um, next question is for Europe. How are concerns about environmental sustainability changing the market? Uh, yeah, well, in Europe, we are quite conscious about the sustainability issues. Um, we hear a lot of uh, sustainability uh, effects on the news, um, but it's mainly uh, impacting uh, the packaging, which is important for you. Uh, in 2020, um, the Green Deal strategy started. It's a, it's a strategy in Europe to reduce, um, especially, um, um, well, a pla a plastic waste, uh, but also environmental, uh, raising environmental issues. Since July 2021, um, we are not allowed to use, for example, some single-use plastics like straws, um, plastic cups. Um, they are not allowed anymore, so that's mainly important for your packaging. And they are trying to, or they are, um, they hope to, their, their aim is to increase even more. Last Wednesday, the European Parliament introduced uh, that in a couple of years, they don't like to have, for example, the plastic uh, bottles in hotels for shampoo. Um, they would like to reduce that uh, or uh, ban it. Uh, same with the uh, Nespresso cups, for example, the coffee cups, they have to be biodegradable in a couple of years. So this is something uh, to keep in mind, uh, especially for packaging. And, and it really is something that's 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 uh, a big thing here in uh, in Europe. I have a question with the packaging mm -hmm. of the hotel industry across Europe with uh, the shampoos are waiting. Is there alternative packaging that's already being introduced in Europe for the I um, maybe biodegradable, yeah. Um, but I haven't seen much yet. No, but I think yeah. There are also like the the shampoo bars yeah, that you can use true. that I don't have bars. like. Uh, mm -hmm. And dispensers, yeah. Yeah, 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 but they are plastic, yeah. Yeah, yeah that you can refill. Yeah, 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 and bars indeed. Um, and well, another thing what's what's happening, of course, in Europe is the high energy prices uh, and the high energy prices, they really affect us as a consumer, um, making us also more aware of those kind of issues, maybe also more about environment. Uh, in the end, it's still about price. So we all care, uh, but it all in the end, it's all about the price. Uh, we don't want to pay a high, high price. Um, it has to be realistic. It has to be a uh, value for money. Um, yeah. More? Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, supermarkets and another, a lot of companies are using environmental issues as a, especially a marketing uh, um, tool. Uh, for example, the Lidl, the, the biggest retailer uh, discounter in, uh, in, in, the, in Europe, well, not the biggest in Europe, but in some parts it, it is the biggest, uh, they, uh, they uh, announced that they don't fly in their produce anymore um, because of the environmental issues. Um, in the end, this is a marketing tool, but it shows that uh, it is important for companies to to care about the environment and to show that to their customers. Yeah, and also looking for uh, local alternatives. Great, thank you. Would anybody else like to chime in? Um, I guess like, <laughs> yeah, Canada is, um, although we're closer to the US, I guess culturally or um, from a sustainability perspective, we're probably closer to Europe. <laughs> uh, and so it's um, definitely something that a lot of consumers are thinking about and considering. And I feel like in um, like a decade or two, it's probably not going to be, um, it's going to be more than just a marketing story. It's going to be, the f it, it would be a necessity um, for every company to have sustainability as part of their messaging to to sell to consumers. Um, uh, yeah, so 
As to what Canada is doing, very similarly to Europe, um, we are banning single plastic um, in the next uh, few years as well. Um, uh, so that's, uh, I guess, something to keep in mind if uh, Canada is the market that you're interested in. Any others? Here. Thanks. Uh, in Mexico, we are mainly as Canada trying to work with that, but it's interesting how not the government, but the retailers are doing their part to keep this environmental um, situation be part of, of their strategy. No plastic bags, uh, eco-friendly packages for food. Um, what else? All these marketing idea of having the producers or the exporters bring the story into Mexico, how they decrease their footprint in the environment is huge. Um, HEB is doing it, Walmart, um, some other retailer regionals like Calimax or Chedrawi, Soriana, which are bigger. Uh, they're jumping into this, um, I don't want to say trend, but this, um, I forgot the word. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yes, in Mexico is pretty much the same way or path that we're following. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so one thing that we've seen, um, the USDA has offices around the world. It's called the Foreign Agricultural Service, and they're working um, on behalf of U.S. agriculture, you know, and um, almost every country. And um, the Europe offices in the last year um, started a campaign that uh, Susto is helping them out with to tell the story of sustainability in the South. Um, so we helped them um, uh, kind of uncover interesting stories to dispel the myth in Europe that, you know, American farming doesn't, uh, that we have no care for sustainability and um, animal uh, quality of life for animals, um, you know, and really uh, telling the story of like family farming and that kind of thing. Sometimes there is a, an image of America as just corporate farming um, that doesn't care about any of the other um, uh, issues that might be really important to Europe, and we know that's not true. So I know USDA has really taken, um, taken that up and is creating videos to that effect um, that they're showing in the European market. Um, in the past month, I know they brought a delegation of European press who are really focused on sustainability and they did a tour in Louisiana um, to see all kinds of different water management measures and um, other farming practices that really focus on sustainability. So uh, USDA knows that this is also a priority and they're really working to combat um, any negative misconceptions that might be out there. <clears throat> all right, on to our next question for Shivan in India. If you were a U.S. entrepreneur and could develop any product, what product would you develop for your market and why? Okay, so I think uh, it's important to understand the makeup of the Indian market before I answer that. Uh, so when we look at India or the Indian consumer, he is somebody who's well-informed and wants a global experience at home. Uh, if we look at the way economy is going, we've been, in fact, our forecast has been upgraded yesterday by the IMF. So we're looking at a 7% uh, GDP growth in the coming year. Uh, India has also been a very resilient economy uh, in terms of COVID. I think the situation was handled well. We have about 85% plus of the population who's fully vaccinated. And we're talking about a population of 1.4 billion. So that I think was a good achievement by the government. Uh, now, when we look at uh, the grow, like when we look at who's going to buy our product, it's not the entire 1.4 million, but it is primarily the middle class or the upper middle class that itself comprises of about 400 million households. Uh, what is driving the growth in our market is the younger generation. So we are a young economy. Majority of our population is uh, working, and uh, you know where we have a strong workforce. The median age in our country is about 28 years. Uh, so going forward also, we see good growth opportunity in our market. Now, what COVID has done is it's uh, changed the way consumer the consumer behavior has changed. The parameters of decision making have changed recently. Uh, the decision making is now people are looking for healthier products. They're looking for convenience. They are looking for a safe and quality, high quality product. Now, I'll talk about them one by one. So if there is a product that has that is healthy that has nu that is nutritious or has high protein uh, content that product is going to do well in our market 
uh, in the past year there has been an increase of about 25% in number of products offering higher protein uh, content so we feel that such products that have a health aspect uh, related to it will definitely do well in our market uh, another aspect is uh, convenience so people are looking at convenience since you know they are the younger generation which is the gen x or the gen z's uh, they want products that are easy to you know one serve products would do well uh, where you have a pouch you open the packet and and you're done so that what happens is even the spend towards the product is limited it's not that they're trying a new flavor and investing too much in it so they get the experience in a smaller packaging even craft products whether it's craft foods or craft spirits uh, this is uh, something that's grown very recently so we are seeing domestic brands as well that are coming up uh, which are highly priced they're not they're not uh, pricing it low but uh, there is enough opportunity or enough uh, there's the pie is so large that even domestic as well as imported market has enough uh, you know opportunities for growth in the market uh, another aspect i would like to mention pet food uh, we are seeing that's that's something that's become uh, quite different today in india we have the pet owners and we have the pet parent so the pet parents are the ones that are really investing in high quality pet products and you know making sure their pets get the best quality product so that's another market that can be looked at and i would not like to forget wood because it's something that's done extremely well in the recent years we're seeing a lot of construction taking place in the tier 2 or tier 3 cities these are the smaller cities in india where you know you're seeing good growth in terms of housing as well as commercial projects so we do see this so this the wood market had gone down a bit during covid due to the lockdown and labor availability but again it's a backup and i think in the future also there'll be a substantial demand for uh, us wood especially syp so these are some of my insights uh, that you know uh, i hope they help you in your journey and uh, we'll be happy to discuss on the one on ones if you have any other questions excellent thank, thank you, you. All right. Our next question is for Andrea in Mexico, um, and Shivan just kind of touched on this as well. But you know, when we think health health products versus cost, um, and there's usually a struggle between consumer desires for healthy foods and what they can afford. So, in your market, where do U.S. <laughs> imports fit into this paradigm? Well, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, as you may know or not, which is fine, uh, we're part of the top five countries with obesity in the world the fifth to be exactly. And we are, well, our government um, was doing some research on, on how the labeling regulation, the front package labeling regulation in, Ch sorry, <coughs> excuse me, in Chile was working. Um, so prior to the entry of this regulation, uh, there was of course a concern of, for, from the government to the consumers to have a better uh, understanding about nutrition and uh, ingredients and everything that that we were um, eating, right? So um, studies indicated, and I'm going to read this because it's important, that 13% of consumers would abandon the purchase of products with these seals, and 74% would review the information of nutritional facts to determine if they will consume or not the product. So in April 2020, when all the booming of pandemic uh, happened, they decided to do the implementation of this new regulation, which was a very blurry moment for us to, to do that uh, strategy in, in Mexico because everything was locked down. Uh, government was in and out uh, answering questions. The verifying companies didn't know very well what was happening. Uh, so at the end of the day, the, the idea to have this is that um, prepackaged processed food and non-alcoholic beverages had these uh, stamps or hexagons in the front package of the products. And this would, of course, um, also include the modification of some uh, labels, especially that goes to the kids. So we had to say goodbye to Tony the Tiger. Uh, <laughs> And of course, all companies had to switch or, or change their communication strategy so they wouldn't be affected um, 
with the government. Uh, so if we want to see and analyze this, in, we will do it in two different perspectives. The first one will be how we adapted to this new regulation uh, as a consumer, or, or if we change our consumption habits. And the other one will be how we integrate this new regulation into our life. Um, so if we see it in this way, uh, it's not working, actually. Uh, <laughs> the times were different and were difficult for us to implement. And the pandemic hit it in the same time. So it changed our concerns. Healthy, um, uh, sorry, I missed the, the idea. Um, employment, economic security, health, hygiene, all of these changed our, our ways to do food. We stayed at home, we purchased like new, like really fresh products for us to prepare at home. So it was more time at home and more time in the kitchen, not working and, and getting this easy food to just to take out and, and eat at home. So regarding this, also we have high saturation of these stamps. 90% of the products that we see on shelves have high fats, high uh, sodium, high everything. So the range of products that we have available as healthy, and I'm gonna do this quote, it's 10% of all the products that we can see in the stores. That also gives us the idea that what's the deal with the hexagons? Everything has either sugar or sodium or trans fat, so it's been getting part of our usual purchasing now. Um, so. Uh, regarding this, the consumer, I mean, we do have greater awareness on what the product is, but it hasn't changed that much the hexagons, the way that we purchase and buy the products. Much, and it was just the, like the pandemic that made us change our habits in the, in the country. So it's kind of working. We are in a struggle because there are a few products that fit on the healthy category that we can purchase, but these products are seen as premium or uh, high-end or very expensive products. And we, again, double think about if we invest that, because we have some other issues and some other things to pay, than just going to a healthy product in the store. So, mm -hmm. Interesting. thank you. Um, Yeah, the, you know, COVID did, uh, as you mentioned, got us like in an alignment of priorities. So right after COVID, where we thought that it was going to be the end and we were all going to die, when we came out, we say, well, you know, now I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to start exercising. And, uh, you know, it's normal. Some of us got on the treadmill. That's usually covered with all our dirty laundry. And but then, you know, we got off the wagon again. So uh, people did caught up and they are looking for healthier products. It's it's a trend. And, and you know, some of us stick to, to some, you know, we're, we're trying to consume less sugar, less carbs and uh, try to walk a little bit more. But then in my particular region, we are price sensitive. Mm -hmm. So usually a product that's very clean label is going to be at the higher end of the price tag. So there has been an interesting trend going on. And you can see these influencers in social media that are bringing back the home remedies. I'm, I'm actually practicing some of those you know i took uh, i learned the other day that honey you get some garlic cloves in it you pinch it with a toothpick and you let that simmer for two weeks and that's a great probiotic improve your immune system now if you can get that in a product that's gonna be terrific two simple ingredients it's not gonna be that expensive to make and that's the idea in my particular region to bring up stuff that it's healthy, but doesn't go to the expensive side of the aisle. So those are the things that most of the consumer base that are located in Central America are looking for. It doesn't necessarily have to be completely clean, 
but something in the middle. That would be more aligned with the disposable income that that consumer base in Central America has. I have to agree. Um, Canadians are price sensitive, but health conscious too. So <laughs> if you can figure out a way to make something that's healthy uh, at an affordable price, then that would be great. Um, the other thing I wanted to add about this uh, question was that uh, I think the U.S. has so much potential. Um, Canadians do turn to U.S. when it comes to like leading trends. You're ahead of us in a lot of uh, different categories and areas. So there's an opportunity there um, to, uh, I guess, continue the research and development um, in, in, in these areas. Um, so in terms of where U.S. fits on this paradigm, I think that's where um, uh, there, there's, a, there's um, potential there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Anybody else? Yep. All right, healthy and affordable, it's what we all want. Um, <laughs> right. Okay, next question. What do exporters not know that may surprise them about your market, Fred, in Central America? All right, well, you didn't know that I was there working for you. <laughs> now you know, that's it. Well, you know, it, it's a very interesting uh, region, and uh, uh, it's close. You you guys uh, know that. It's, it's, I was reading uh, an article about uh, that McKinsey uh, did on the region. And before COVID, the region was growing uh, at a larger uh, a, uh, rate than South America. So uh, it's still performing very well. It was affected by COVID, of course, like all the economies in the world. Some of them, Panama, was hit harder uh, because their actual uh, economics and finances were not pretty much in order, but they were able to bounce back. But other than that, everyone in the region is, uh, is positive in GDP growth. So it's the 19th economy in the world. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. And uh, it's not as big as, you know, when, when, when our colleague mentioned that 400 million people are, you know, <laughs> part of the higher income, uh, 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 part of the society in India, you know, in Central America, we only have 56 million people. So out of that, you know, about 50% are uh, very cautious with what they ha can spend and then everything else, you know, the other 50% would be divided between middle class and then middle class, you have to go into lower middle class and upper middle class, which there's a significant difference there. And then you have the high class, which usually, uh, you know, it's about 6%. And so... We do have a, a limited uh, uh, consumer base, but again, there is good opportunities. Uh, it's not going to be at first also a large volume region. Uh, usually the importers in the region would like to test the markets and you will probably get orders that, you know, one pallet, two pallets. That depends a lot on the product too. but usually start small, you're gonna to have to learn about consolidation, what is it, you're gonna to have to send those pallets usually to Miami, which is where most of the importers have their uh, consolidators, and, uh, and they will take it from there. So after that, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, testing the market. You know, we usually get that question, okay, so, so will my product work, you know, and you have to, it, it's a trial and error exercise. Um, I've seen products that, in my opinion, when I see it, I say, wow, you know, this is not going to fly. But when we start communicating with importers, there is interest in the product. So after that, you know, we've decided that we will never say this is going to fly, this is not going to fly. We have to try it to see if it's going to work or not. So, and 
there's opportunities because even though that economic growth was you know slow down not stop slow down because of covid it's going to keep at it again and what we're seeing which is a normal trend throughout the world i believe is urbanization so by 2030 urbanization by 2030 77 percent of the population in central america are going to be living in the cities so what does that mean that means that more restaurants more convenience stores more uh, products that are heat and eat ready to eat and things that are convenient that you don't need to spend a lot of time in cooking them that are going to have opportunities in, and they they are being successful now so the younger generation which is also what you need to start you know learning how how we the younger generation think <laughs> Because that's, that's your consumer base right there. You know, uh, the dinosaurs uh, like me, that we've already have our minds set up and we know what we want, we know what we like, and we're probably not going to be adventuring too much into new stuff. Earlier during lunch, we were talking about the hard seltzer uh, products that we're starting to see in our markets. I've tried them, but, you know, they, they don't do it for me. But there is, there is a big part of the younger generation that are really consuming this product. So that's something that we need to keep in mind, that we are working for the next generations that are the ones that are going to be making most of the purchasing decisions. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Our final question is for Canada. Which local Canadian products will U.S. exporters have to compete with in the market? So I feel like in almost every category, you will likely have a competitor <laughs> um, that's producing it in the Canadian market. Um, unless you have, say, you know, a particular hardwood lumber product that's not grown in Canada, unless you have fresh produce products that, again, because of our limited uh, climate, we can't grow in Canada. Um, but then the two categories that are most um, challenging when it comes to competition are probably uh, the categories that are tied within our tariff rate quota system, which would be our dairy and poultry products. And so what this means is basically the government controls the amount of um, product within these categories that can be uh, produced within the domestic uh, economy in our uh, country, but it also controls um, the amount of products that can be imported into the country when it comes to that category. So I'd say there's definitely increased competition for um, cheese, uh, milk-related products, and I know Tim and I have talked about this earlier, uh, as well as poultry. So that would include um, turkey, um, chicken, and, and egg products. Any other markets want to chime in? Yeah. Oh, I got it. <laughs> uh, as I'm... <laughs> As I mentioned to you, you know, in the beginning, and uh, uh, Hong Kong is, uh, you know, we got more chance because of the, their high income, and uh, also Hong Kong can be considered the most uh, um, the most expensive city in, in in the world, especially for the property, and uh, so uh, Hong Kong we can got another opportunity for the organic. And uh, Hong Kong market is uh, still is uh, some the soon market, uh, and uh, they are carried uh, organic products. Espe especially we got uh, another called uh, three three sixty. This is only carried uh, organic products like the Whole Foods in the United States. So I think about you know the, if you have the, any the products for the organic, I think the Hong Kong can be the consider another you know the the the, uh, the market for export. And therefore, mainly China still is challenging because you know the Chinese government and the, the process for the verified the and the verified the organic is very challenging and very complicated. So I think I, sug I suggest that Hong Kong and Macau, maybe we can consider for the organic product. Yeah, thank you. Great. 
Great. Thank you. Um, and we have a little bit of time, so I think we can open it up to Q&A if anybody has questions for a particular market um, or anybody in particular. One of the challenges we have with our ag products is in other countries, it seems to take forever. We have to have them registered there, and it's very time consuming, very slow, and very expensive. So I didn't know if anybody had any uh, comments. Uh, and I'm not sure SUSTA can help with the expense of getting products registered in other countries as well. But just a question. So when it comes to SESTA funding, which we'll talk about in a minute with our cost share program, that's really for the promotion of products more than anything that's considered the cost of doing business, which would uh, registering a product would fall under that. Um, but does anybody have any thoughts on? Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, it takes, it takes a long time to register products. Uh, to be honest, it has improved a little bit. It used to take longer. Uh, you know, each each country is working on uh, trying to set that procedure uh, faster, but th there's still a lot of bureaucracy in it, and uh, unfortunately, there, there's no way around it. So that now, what what we have heard from some importers is that when they talk to this about to the exporter and they request the documents then sometimes the exporters are not as diligent you know they don't get the documents they don't supply what they need uh, and that sometimes also uh, is factor into the equation so I think that the only thing that as an exporter you guys can do now is to uh, as soon as that importer says hey you know I need these documents try to provide them as soon as possible and they will take care of the rest. But yeah, it usually takes a while. And in the past, the governments and customs were allowing the products to come in without registration. So now what they do is that they might allow one shipment to come in without registration, but the next shipment, at least you need that um, certification that you have applied for the registration. You don't necessarily need to have the registration per se, but to present documentation saying that everything has been submitted. So that's why some importers are very um, diligent on, on telling you guys, hey, I need this as soon as possible because they don't need the actual certification to work for the next couple of shipments. Just by presenting to the authorities that they, read, they submitted the paperwork, that will be good enough for them. Yeah, yeah and I think time-wise, as uh, for Mexico, it can take you up to a year and a half or two to get your products into the country. Um, and it's all, uh, as Fred was saying, follow up with the importer or the buyer, uh, get everything done. In Mexico, we are very relationship-wise, so you have to develop that relationship first, then try to do the business, come to the country, get to meet the, the consumers, your buyer, your importer, the process and everything else. So you can bring the product in a fastest way to say it somehow. Uh, so yeah, it takes time, a lot of patience and a lot of follow up. Great, thank you. Yes. I hope this makes sense while I'm getting ready to ask. <laughs> Um, what minority-based programs do you guys have in place and barriers to entry regarding exports, I guess, imports to your countries? Did that make sense? Yeah. Um, so for SESTA, we don't have any specific programs that are – you know, we are um, in our outreach trying to make sure that we are doing enough outreach to all communities. Um, but our programs are federally funded and are generally um, available, you know, to everybody uh, in the same way. Um, where we're approaching it is just trying to make sure that we're doing um, all the, the right outreach to every community so that we're not um, leaving anybody behind. But are you asking for the foreign markets? Yes, for the foreign yeah. markets, yes. Um, yeah, I can try to answer that. Um, 
So for Canada, like in the U.S., I think um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, has been a very big topic exactly. for us the last couple of years. Um, unfortunately, like we've been talking to a lot of U.S. suppliers that have been telling us, um, you know, they're women-owned or black-owned, and uh, there's retail programs that really acknowledge that kind of, um, uh, I guess, DEI uh, community. Our retailers have not been that sophisticated on that note, um, uh, but a, a community that's um, of particular interest for Canadians have been more the Indigenous community. Um, and so I think, if anything, that has been more of our focus the last couple of years. Um, but, uh, but who knows, maybe we'll catch up to the US in terms of opportunities there. Anybody else? All right. Um, so we have time for a quick break. And I think, um, oh, shoot, I have the old agenda, right? It's a break right now. Yes. Um, so there's some uh, beverages outside. If anybody needs to go to the bathroom, it's this way. And then we'll get started right at 2.30. We're going to do um, a brief presentation on SESTA. I know some of you are new to SESTA, and so we just wanted to uh, go over the highlights. And then the Kentucky Department of Agriculture is going to also say a few words. And then we will do the uh, breakout meetings. We still have some time slots open if anybody wants to sign up for any other meetings. Um, I'll be at the podium, so come find me there.